Death speaks. There was a merchant in Baghdad who sent his servant to market to buy provisions. And in a little while, the servant came back white and trembling and said, Master, just now when I was in the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd. And when I turned, I saw it was death that jostled me. She looked at me and made a threatening gesture. Now, lend me your horse, and I will ride away from this city and avoid my fate. I will go to Samara, and there death will not find me. The merchant lent him his horse, and the servant mounted it, and he dug his spurs in its flanks, and as fast as the horse could gallop, he went. Then the merchant went down to the marketplace, and he saw me standing in the crowd, and he came to me and said, Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant when you saw him this morning? That was not a threatening gesture, I said. It was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, for I had an appointment with him tonight in Samara. Those are the first words you'll read when you open up John O'Hara's appointment in Samara. That passage, borrowed from W. Somerset Maugham's 1933 play Sheppy, sets up the main theme of this novel. It's a story of inescapable fate, as well as class consciousness, or even class self-consciousness, in an age of extreme, crushing societal expectations. Welcome to Echoed Words Reviews. Hope you're having a great day, or if you're listening to this before you fall asleep, I hope that this lulls you into a very restful slumber. Um, things are starting to cool down around here. Fall is fast approaching. Uh, the trees are turning. The days are getting shorter, uh, which is great for reading. Uh, so, anyway, without further ado, my name doesn't matter. Let's get into it and talk about John O'Hara's appointment in Samara. Cheers. Woo! So before we talk about the book itself, let's just take a moment and um, really appreciate how beautiful a copy this is. I believe this was a reprint in 1980. Uh, or sometime in the 1980s. And it's a, an identical, like an exact replica of the original 1934 publication. Uh, a beautiful hardcover with this, you know, plastic uh, dust sleeve. And what I really like is that on the back, let's see if you can see this. There we go. On, on the back, they even printed uh, like, you know, the rest of Harcourt Brace and Company's uh, upcoming uh, publications or popular publications for the time that this uh, book uh, came out originally and I am I'm a sucker for that usually I don't like hardcovers uh, but when I saw this I just had to have it uh, the only thing different about this from the original is that it comes with this little leaflet here which is a new introduction from John Updike who uh, Updike was a big proponent of O'Hara's genius. He thought he was very underappreciated and didn't get the attention that he rightly deserved. Well, they say not to judge a book by its cover, so enough about the exterior. Let's talk about what's inside it. Appointment in Samara was John O'Hara's first novel. Published in 1934, it offered a sobering view of what high society was like in the late 1920s and early 1930s, Kind of similar to what Fitzgerald was doing in Great Gatsby. However, O'Hara was a bit younger than Fitzgerald and uh, was actually part of what's now known or, or called the hangover generation. People who rode the coattails of the success of the prior generation. They didn't work for their success. They inherited it and were thus ill-equipped and unprepared for the hardships of the Great Depression. Set in a small, prosperous, anthracite mining community called Gibbsville, Pennsylvania, this book is a skewering condemnation of the idle upper class. Partly a satire, though not in the Louis Ferdinand Saline journey to the end of the night makes you laugh type satire. This is really a, a bitter rebuke of this tight-knit, exclusive, useless group of people. The bulk of the novel is dedicated to following one doomed man, Julian English, who over the course of three days completely destroys his career, his reputation, his marriage, and ultimately his life through a series of increasingly impulsive self-destructive acts. 
It all starts at a Christmas party when he throws his drink in another man's face. This action has far-reaching ramifications uh, as it puts a strain on Julian English's relationship with his neighbors, his wife, and sets in motion a chain of events that ultimately leads to his downfall. At its core, Appointment in Samara has this very Freudian, Thanatos, death drive thing going on, uh, wherein Julian channels it outwardly with, with external uh, displays of aggression towards others, as well as internally, fueling more and more impulsive acts of extreme drunkenness, depression, helplessness, and a lot of suicidal ideation. All because this character, Julian, is buckling under the expectations of this class system that he absolutely despises with every fiber of his being. It's the story of a man who will do literally anything to escape this vapid, self-obsessed, superficial prison of the American high life at the early days of the Great Depression. Julian English is committed to destroying himself. His fate has put him on a mining cart with no brakes and headed straight for a wall. And along the way, he'll do anything to speed up that process. The book will occasionally break away and focus on the other members of the community, and that can be pretty entertaining at times. Uh, it's bookended with a family known as the Flieglers? 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 Uh, and they are the upstanding white Anglo-Saxon Protestant thriving in this type of environment. Dedicated husband, beautiful wife, beautiful kids, uh, very idyllic. But then it, it cuts away and focuses on some of the other people. There's a mid-level enforcer for the local mob boss that has some interesting, uh, some interesting stuff. It focuses on Julian's dad, who is hilarious. Not, not because the character says anything funny, but because his characterization is so funny. He's this local doctor who loves performing surgery, even though he is completely negligibly talentless at it. And then it focuses on Caroline, Julian English's wife. She has a whole chapter uh, to herself. It's a very interesting character. And her chapter, the chapter that sort of goes into her past and explores her character a bit more, it has one of my favorite passages in this entire book. When Caroline Walker fell in love with Julian English, she was a little tired of him. That was in the summer of 1926, one of the most unimportant years in the history of the United States and the year in which Caroline Walker was sure her life had reached a pinnacle of uselessness. For some reason, that passage just, that passage stuck out uh, with me. Maybe because I've reached that age where I feel like my life has reached its pinnacle of uselessness. <laughs> Let's rewind a bit. Why does Julian throw the drink? Well, to understand that, I think that we have to understand uh, a bit about John O'Hara and his story, because John O'Hara is Julian English. So when he started writing this, John O'Hara was a 28-year-old journalist. To be 28 and to be so insightful and just have such a knack for being able to get at the heart of social dynamics and interpersonal relationships, it, it's magical. It's something that I don't think you find from authors nowadays. I hate to be one of those people to deride modern literature, but it's true. I think that a lot of younger people now understand ideas, but they don't understand people. And then you have somebody like O'Hara, who really understands people. And when you read him, it's so obvious. Even Hemingway saw that, that magic, saw his talent. Uh, about this book, Hemingway said, if you want to read a book by a man who knows exactly what he is writing about and has written it marvelously well, read Appointment in Samara by John O'Hara. Hemingway is right on the money. Uh, he really is. Some critics have been harsh about O'Hara in the past, uh, particularly Upton Sinclair thought he was juvenile and needlessly vulgar because compared to his uh, contemporaries, O'Hara definitely wrote about sex a little more directly, a little more vulgarly. Uh, when you read it now, though, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's hokey. It's very kabuki theater. It's hidden behind a veil. But for the time, yeah, I guess maybe it was more vulgar. I don't know. When you read how uh, 
even just 30 years after this, you know, in the 60s with the beat poets and how they depicted sex, this is, it, it's, it's nothing. It's not knocking it, but, you know, it was definitely a product of the times. It is funny to see how some people were so aghast about it, though. So anyway, like I said, O'Hara was a 28-year-old journalist when he started working on this book. And he was a wildly prolific journalist. He, he was working all the time, but it wasn't bringing in enough money. Especially not for somebody who drank as much as O'Hara. And this man drank. And so, at the behest of his friend, Dorothy Parker, uh, he decided to write a book to try and make money. Which is wild to think about. Um, he needs money. What's he going to do? You're going to write a novel. It's just, man, oh, how times have changed. So when he sat down to write his book, he decided to write it about his hometown. And in the text, his bitterness, his vitriol is, is palpable for this oppressive, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, white bread, upper crust, East Coast society that he came from. What every single one of his reasons was for being as bitter as he is, I don't think any of us will ever know, but as John Updike explores in the introduction, a, a big part of it is due to the fact that John O'Hara is Irish. That's his heritage. He's an Irish Catholic at a time when Irish Catholics were second class, excluded from waspy society. And so he channels that into his book and into his main character, who is ironically named Julian English. And in another twist of irony, the person who, who gets the drink thrown in their face is an Irishman. But despite the fact that Julian English is English, uh, if that wasn't obvious, uh, a lot of O'Hara's own bitterness bleeds through into his thoughts. There's a passage where Julian English expresses his disgust because he feels not due to anything this person has done, mind you, but just due to how the social hierarchy is constructed, how he feels inferior to his dim-witted secretary. Somehow her tone filled him with terror, the kind that he felt when he knew he was doing something bad. It was an old experience. He still thought of it in terms of boyhood. Quote, when I'm doing something bad. End quote. And it wasn't her tone alone. It was her manner, and it was not a new manner. For weeks, and probably months, she had behaved like someone, a schoolteacher who was meaning to speak to him about his lessons or conduct. She was right, and he was wrong. She could make him feel like a thief, a lecher, although God knows he never made a pass at her, a drunkard, a no-good bum. She represented precisely what she came from, solid, respectable, Pennsylvania Dutch, Lutheran middle class. And when he thought about her, when she made her existence felt, when she actively represented what she stood for, he could feel the little office suddenly becoming overcrowded with a delegation of all the honest clerks and mechanics and housewives and Sunday school teachers and widows and orphans, all the Christiana Street kind of people who he knew secretly hated him, and all Lantanago Street people. They could have their illegitimate babies, their incest, their paresis, their marital bestiality, their cruelty to animals, their horrible treatment of their children, and all the other things which you could find in individual families. But collectively, they presented a solid front of sound Pennsylvania Dutch, and all that implied, or was supposed to imply. I mean, my god. That is, uh... O'Hara really just... He pulls no punches. I guess O'Hara had uh, advice for another Irish writer, a friend of his, also from the same town they grew up in. He said, uh, if you're going to get out of that god-awful town, for God's sake, write something that will make you get out of it. It seems he took his own advice to heart with appointment in Samara. This, to me, is John O'Hara's Julian English moment. But instead of just throwing a drink in somebody's face, O'Hara goes and writes an Irishman's bitter excoriation of the useless, superficial, idle, judgmental, upper-crust Protestant society of the time. It's like O'Hara needed an out, and the only way that he was able to get it is by lighting that bridge on fire and then cackling maniacally while lighting a cigarette off the flames. It's a surefire way to become a persona non grata from this closed-off, walled-off society. 
You know, it's a, it's a shame that more people haven't read or heard of John O'Hara. For some reason, he refused to ever let any of his writings be published in the anthologies that were taught in schools, which is why he remains, in my opinion, underappreciated. He is one of the great American authors. I would put him up there with, with Steinbeck and Faulkner and, and Hemingway. He may not be as grand as them, but he is so, so, so insightful. It really is a tremendous book. So, should you read Appointment in Samara? Yes, definitely if you're into American literature. If you like The Great Gatsby, you should read this book. I think it's better than Gatsby. I think it plays in the same sandbox, but does it better. This book is an embittered takedown of the American obsession with class and social status. It tears down the materialism and the keeping up with the Joneses. It critiques the, this culture that puts so much importance on cars, on clothes, on houses, in a way that's refreshing to read even today. So definitely give Appointment in Samara a read. It is a forgotten treasure, in my opinion. Well, with the review over, now it's time for our stickiness uh, rating. Our completely arbitrary and meaningless <laughs> way of rating books, where we take the number of pages of the book and divide it by the number of things that stuck out to me, and then find out roughly how many pages you have to go for something noteworthy. Uh, and with this book, it is 301 pages long, and there were 38 stickies, which gives us a, a stickiness rating of 7.9, which is pretty good. That's uh, more sticky than the last book. Again, it's not a rating system to judge quality of books. Uh, it is just a way to justify all of this crap. So that was Appointment in Samara. A great work of American literature, albeit a forgotten one. If you enjoyed this review or have read Appointment in Samara or any of John O'Hara's other works like uh, Butterfield 8, I want to read that down the line, uh, drop a like, drop a comment, uh, let me know what you think of either the review or the book. And if you didn't like it, uh, drop a dislike and leave a comment. Let me know what I can do to get better in the future. Uh, but as always, Hope you're having a great day, and I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you so much. Bye.